It's because we have the moon that we enjoy the greatest astronomical spectacular, a total eclipse of the sun. There'd be more if it weren't for the five degree tilt of the moon's orbit with respect to the plane of the ecliptic, here in green. During each orbit of Earth, the moon twice intersects the ecliptic plane, here and here. For an eclipse to occur, Earth, Moon and Sun must all be in line at an intersection. Imagine you, the viewer of the Sun. As alignment approaches, here's the total eclipse. If the intersection is on the far side of Earth, the event is a lunar eclipse. A lunar eclipse works like this. Moving into the shadow of Earth, the Moon turns blood red. Indirect light from the sun is bent and filtered by Earth's atmosphere and projected onto the moon. Lasting up to an hour and three quarters, a lunar eclipse is always seen on the night side of Earth. Now an eclipse of the sun, but because the moon's orbit is slightly elliptical, this eclipse isn't total. The moon's shadow doesn't quite reach us. The result is an annular eclipse. The moon, at its farthest from Earth, is too distant to fully obscure the sun. This time, the moon is closer in its orbit, close enough for the dark inner shadow, the umbra, to sweep Earth at supersonic speed. Such an alignment happens about 70 times a century. On Earth, the umbra is creating a total eclipse. The outer penumbra delivers a partial. For those in the shadow of the umbra, and with a clear sky, totality verges on the magical. As the moon creeps over the brilliant solar disk, this partial phase can last an hour and a half. The diamond ring. The moon is shutting off the sun. Then, as the last beams twinkle through the lunar mountains, Bailey's beads and totality. It happens because the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, while the moon is 400 times closer to us than is the sun. Beyond the sun, the moon and the planets are the stars of this graphic guide. Stars that each night appear to journey through the heavens. But it's not the stars that are moving, it's our planet, a daily rotation on an axis hitched to the celestial poles. The pole star, Polaris, marks the north celestial pole. Around it, star trails reveal the rotation of planet Earth in this overnight exposure. The south celestial pole has no marker star, just the nearby constellation of Crux Australis, the Southern Cross. As Earth rotates, so the sky appears to circle the emptiness of the south celestial pole. We see the varying brightness of stars and two blue patches, neighboring galaxies to our Milky Way. Here's how to find the north celestial pole. Identify the plough or Big Dipper, an easy pattern. It's part of Ursa Major, the constellation of the Great Bear. Two stars point the way to the pole star Polaris. We've reached the North Celestial Pole. Our view is north from the mid-latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere. It's mid-evening. With Ursa Major, these are the circumpolar constellations, stars that circle the pole. From this latitude, they don't rise and set like most constellations. But they have their seasonal shifts. Four minutes a night, six hours every three months. For the South Celestial Pole, string a line from Crux Australis, the Southern Cross, to Achenar, a brilliant star. The midpoint is the pole. A whole gaggle makes up the circumpolar constellations. Our view is south from the mid-latitudes of the Southern Hemisphere. It's mid-evening. 
These circumpolar stars don't rise or set, but they conduct their seasonal circuit. For the observer, whatever the season, only half the sky is visible from any point on Earth. In the Northern Hemisphere, this is the view from the mid-latitudes, the first zone featured in each of our four seasonal guides. Next is the equatorial zone, the tropics, the second featured in our guides. The third is the view from the mid-latitudes of the Southern Hemisphere, from places like Australia and southern South America. We're in the northern hemisphere, looking at the northern sky. Our target is the pole star, Polaris. Viewed first at 40 degrees north, say from Washington, D.C., Polaris drops lower in the sky, the farther south we travel. At Panama City, just 10 degrees north of the equator, Polaris would be here, South of the equator, Polaris is gone. Instead, in this view to the south, we see the south celestial pole. The farther south we go, the higher the pole rises. Now, at about 40 degrees south, this is the view from Melbourne, Australia. Although the tilt of Earth is always 23 degrees, its axis hasn't always pointed to the celestial poles of today. It's because Earth wobbles like a spinning top. Known as precession, the main cause is the Moon's pull on the equator. The effect on the North Celestial Pole is to move it around a great circle. Once the North Star was Thuban, Today it's Polaris, and in 4,000 years' time, it'll be Alderamin. The whole cycle takes just under 26,000 years. As with maps of the world, astronomers divide the sky into a grid. Here, the celestial equator is drawn directly above Earth's equator. To the north, at 10 degree intervals, are lines of declination. It's the same to the south. They're like latitude lines. This line equals zero longitude. It's called the first point of Aries. To the left, divided into hours, minutes and seconds, are lines of right ascension east, and the other side, lines of right ascension west. A reference grid that can pinpoint any celestial object. And there's a handy way to do it. The outstretched hand at arm's length measures off 15 degrees of sky, an hour's right ascension. The clenched fist is 10 degrees, again held at arm's length. The span of three fingers close together is 5 degrees. And finally, the little finger, set at arm's length against the heavens, is just 1 degree. But that's bigger than you think. In lunar terms, it's a lot of sky. By night, the moon may appear the largest celestial object, but it measures only half a little finger, half a degree. To get the best from stargazing, the observer needs a telescope, or at least good binoculars. Too much is missed by naked eye. For the new observer, Better to buy binoculars with quality optics than a poor telescope. The investment will last a lifetime. Marked on every pair are numbers specifying magnification and lens size. These, 10 by 50. The 10 indicates that this pair will give a tenfold magnification of the image. The 50 is the size of the lenses, both 50 millimeters. Here, the eyepieces are marked 5 millimeters. That's the width of the exit pupil, the light beam from the eyepieces. The size you need depends on age. If you're under 40, the pupils of your eyes will dilate to 7 millimeters. If you're over 40, just 5. If you're young, you'll see best through an exit pupil of 7 millimeters. So use binoculars marked 7 by 50 or 10 by 70. Dividing the numbers gives the exit pupil, 